So uh, today we're going to begin with uh, this book, just to correlate, you know, the information, get another source, kind of saying the same thing. And little by little, we pull the babies out of all these books, you know, uh, this book's called Phoenician Origin of Britons, Scots and Anglo-Saxons by L.A. Waddell. This is another book I had, um, you know, saved up for the last four years. And uh, shout out to Big Judah. Yeah, you know, there's a time for everything, you know. <laughs> so we got to gain a full understanding because I could just read these books, you know, just to make videos. But it wouldn't have meant nothing to me if I didn't know what, what I was reading. So I think that we're all at a point where we can like, we know, the, you know, the uh, history of America and we can start going into other uh, lands and stuff and other peoples and nations. And, uh, you know, I, I like history in general. It's not just about ancient American history. You know, I like history in general. It always interests me. So again, uh, this uh, some great drop in this book. We're going to actually get into this book a lot more in future videos, right? Because we're about to, we're getting into all this, right? I remember so-called Phoenicians, right? The sea people. And uh, we've correlated a lot of the time that a lot of, the, you know, that these Phoenicians most likely were coming from ancient America or Canaan, the real Canaan, because that's what it says biblically, right? They were coming out of Canaan. Canaan was in America, the promised land, right? Great drop. We're going to go to a specific chapter in this book that correlates with what we're learning. So again, this is the Phoenician origin of Britain, Scots, and Anglo-Saxons, uh, discovered by Phoenician and Sumerian inscriptions in Britain by pre-Roman Britain coins and mass of new history, all right? Again, what? Sumerian the Shinar, Shinar, Summer, Shinar, remember where was Shinar, Europe, British Isles, Chaldea being Ireland, the capital, the city, Ur. All right, you see what they're finding here? This is again by L.A. Waddell. He's a fellow of a Royal Anthropological Institute, Lenin and Folklore Societies, Honorable Correspondent, Indian Archaeological Survey, ex-professor of Tibetan and London University, all right? And the thing is, we don't go off just one person. You got to understand that these people have sources. So you're talking about, well, you're not going to believe this guy. It's not about believing this guy. He has sources. You have footnotes. Go verify the sources. All right, this was written in 1924. Just want to show you this image, which is almost right in the beginning of this uh, book. And it says here, Aryan Phoenician inscriptions, just like we read in the last video right in that book or of Chaldees how I was saying that it seems that all these languages go back to at least two specific main languages which was Aryan and Semitic right or Shemitic Semitic Aryan Phoenician Phoenician is Paleo Hebrew which is Shemitic inscriptions on Newton stone of part 
Tolong, king of the Scots, about 400 BC, calling himself Britain, Hittite, and Phoenician. All right, that's there. That's right there, you see? That's historical, archaeological, that's there. You can't explain that away. All right, so we're going to be reading from chapter 12 of this book. All right, again, we skipped a lot of chapters. We're going to go into all those chapters, most likely. A lot of good drop. This is what's correlating with us. And just want to show you what it says here. It says, who were the Celts properly so-called? Disclose an identity of early British Celts or Celts and Kuldis or Chuldis with the Chaldees of Van and the Picts. Now, Chaldees, right? Chaldees switch to the K for a C. You got Chaldees too. Or you can say Chaldees, right? Like Ur of the Chaldees. Celts are called Chaldees or Chaldees. But before we go into chapter 12, uh, on the previous chapter, just said something at the end, which was going into this chapter. I just want to read that. It says here, and this is talking about Picts arriving in Albion and Stone Age, right? So the Picts, right? Who was the ancient Picts of Scotland? It says in Cornwall, the prehistoric worlds of pure stone called Pixies, grindstones, and presumably amulets are also called snake stones. This serpent cult character of the pigs, the serpent, right? The serpents would explain the prevalence of human sacrifice amongst the druid priests of the aborigines who were of the this, this lunar matriarchs cult. All right, so dodge the hijack and also the historical notices of the existence of cannibalism amongst the barbarian tribes of Caledonia, the Chalidonians or Caledonians, as late as the time of Saint Jerome fourth century AD as well as the traditional emulation of a victim by Saint Columba and founding his first church at Iona for the Coldies or Pigs. Coldies? So the pigs were called Coldies. At an H right here between the C and the U you get Chuldies or Chaldies. Right? Alright. Am I reaching? Let's see. It thus transpires by the new evidence that the pigs were the primitive, small-statured, prehistoric aborigines of Albion or Britain with a riverbed type of skulls. They were presumably a branch of the primitive, small-statured, narrow-brown and long-headed dark race of matriarchist serpent-worshipping cave dwellers of the Van Lake region, the Van, Biani, Fen, or Chaldees, or primitive Chaldees. You see that? primitive Chaldees, the Chaldean people, who? The Celts, these pigs. We're not even the Celts yet, but these pigs, a part of them, a dark race. Remember what source we're in, right? We weren't expecting this, but they're letting us know these so-called indigenous aboriginal prehistoric people, right? Or a dark race of matriarchs, serpent worshiping, they're calling it, dodge the hijack. But they were a primitive Chaldees Chaldees or Khaleds or Khaledons, Chaldean, Chaldees or of the Chaldees. Again, you know, we're reading this book, Ireland or of the Chaldees, which we're going to get into uh, some more chapters later on. All right, let's go back. Chaldees and the Chaldees or Chaldees, as you can see here. Chaldees, right? Chaldees, Khaleds, or Caledons, who in early prehistoric times in the Old Stone Age sent off from this central hive swarm after swarm of hunger marchers under matriarchs westward across Asia Minor to Europe as far as Iberia in the Biscay region after the retreating ice. All right, so this is their story. They, the, what was interesting, you know, when I was reading that is, is how they literally just said Chaldees, right? And they're talking about these pigs, the Chaldees. All right, so again, this is chapter 12. Who were the Celts? Properly so-called. The Chaldees, the Kuldees, the Chaldees, remember? A vent in the pigs. says here, rightly to elicit the real racial agency by which uncivilized ancient Britain became Aryanized in language, high culture, and civilized institutions in the pre-Roman period. It is still necessary for us to re-examine and strive to solve the vexed question of the Celts. For the existing confusion in the use of this term forms one of the greatest obstacles to clear thinking on the subject as cited in the heading. And this gross confusion has been a chief cause by the delay 
hitherto in solving the origin of the Britons and the Aryan question in Britain. At the outset, we are confronted by the paradox that while philologists and popular writers generally in this country assume that the Celts were Aryans in race as well as in language and were the parents of the Britons or Britons and the Scots and Irish, notwithstanding that the early Britons are also called non-Aryan pre-Celtic Aborigines. On the other hand, scientific anthropologists uh, and classic historians have proved that the Celts of history were non-Aryan, round-headed, darkish, small-statured race, all right, dark, swarthy, right? of South Germany and Switzerland, and that the Celts properly so-called are totally lacking in the British Isles. So they got that from uh, this one guy, all right, Let's check the footnote. Thus to speak, as is so commonly done of Celtic ancestry, the Celtic temperament and Celtic fire amongst any sec section of the natives of these islands is according to anthropologists merely imaginary. The term Celt or Celt is entirely unknown as the designation of any race or racial element or language in the British Isles, all right? Pay attention to that. Until arbitrarily introduced there a few generations ago, they just introduced these words. Nor does the name even exist in the so-called Celtic languages, the Gaelic, Welsh, and Irish. It is on the contrary the classic Greek and Latin title of a totally different race, of a totally different physical type from that of the British Isles. All right, you see that? They're saying that the Greeks and Lang actually is the ones that use that word and actually named that to a different type of people. Not the same original people we're talking about. And that word was only introduced there by unscientific philologists and ethnologists some decades ago. The Celts or Celts first appear in history under that name in the pages of Herodotus, right, by the Greeks. They're saying 480 to 408 BC. He calls them Celt Oi and locates them on the continent of Western Europe. He says, for the Easter Danube, beginning from the Celt Oi, divides Europe in its course. But the Celt Oi of Gaul are beyond the pillars of Hercules and border on the territories of the Cunesi Oi or the Cunet Oi, supposed to be Finistir, who lived the furthest to the west of all the peoples of Europe. Strabo, writing in a few decades after Caesar's epic, gives further details regarding the ancient Greek formation on the Celts, whom he calls Celt Oi. He says, the ancient Greeks afterwards becoming acquainted with those natives towards the west styled them Celt I, Celts and Iberian or Iberians, right? Iberians, sometimes compounding the names into Celti Iberian or Celti Iberian or Celtocitian, thus ignorantly uniting various distinct nations. You see, they were grouping mad people together is what they're letting you know that these Greeks and Latins were actually doing. So there is, that's why there is some confusion as who the Celts or Celts were. Again, the original people never called themselves that. It's not even part of their language. It says, no true Celts in British Isles. It says, continues, says, Strabo habitually uses the term Celtica, or land of the Celts for Gaul, which corresponded generally to modern France, including Switzerland, and defines it as thus. So Strabo says, Celtica is bounded on the southwest by the mountains of the Pyrenees of southern France, which extended to either sea, both the Mediterranean and the ocean, on the east by the Rhine, on the north by the ocean from the northwestern extremity of the Pyrenees to the mouth of the Rhine, on the south by the Sea of Marseilles, and by the Alps from Liguria, Genoa, to the sources of the Rhine. He excludes Iberia or Spain, Portugal, from Celtica, noting that Pyrenees chain divides Celtica from Iberia, but he adds, a forest extends the size of Celtica too far, including within it what we would designate as Iberia, as far as Gates, Genoa, and Piedmont on the Italian side of the Alps, whose people, he says, were named by the Greeks Celto Ligus or Celto Ligurian. It is also noteworthy that he calls the inhabitants of Celtica or Gaul not only Celt I, but also them and their land repeatedly Gala Galatic, Galatic, or variants of Galatia, Celt, and he includes the Belgi as Celts. 
but Strabo, like Caesar and all other Greco-Roman writers, without exception, expressly excludes Britain from Celtica or the land of the Celts. Thus, he writes, it's Britain's longest side lies parallel to Celtica, Gaul, and he emphasizes the difference between the physical appearance of the inhabitants of Britain and the Celts or Celts of Gaul, describing the latter, the Celts, as a short statured race with light yellow hair. Hmm. Remember, the short statured race was dark, even though they had light yellow hair, they were dark skinned. Just like picture the East Southeast Malaysians, right? Caesar also in the well-known opening paragraph in his commentaries, whilst affirming the identity of the Celtai or Celts with the Galli or Gauls, restricts the title Celt to mid gal west of the Seine, that is to Old Brittany, with Armorica, 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 the Loire Valley and Switzerland. He says, all Gaul, okay, Galia, is divided into three parts one of which the Belgi inhabit the Aquitani, another, those who in their own language are called Celts or Celtae, and ours Gauls or Galli, the third, and neither Caesar nor Tacitus nor any other of the Greeks or Roman historians or writers ever refer to the Celts or Celts as inhabitants of Britain or of Hibernia. All right, you hear that? In British history and literature, the first mention of Celts appears to be in 1607 in an incidental reference to the Celts, not in Britain, but in France. And again in 1656 in Blunt's glossography, which defines Celt, one born in Gaul. And again in 1782, contrasting the British with the Celts in Gaul in the sentence. The obstinate war between the insular Britons and the continental Celts. But all of these references are un equivocally to the Celts in France and not in Britain. The older philologists were thus mainly responsible for this arbitrary extension of the name Celtic in a racial sense to the earlier inhabitants of the British Isles. The confusion arose through the popular misconception that because a people spoke a dialect of the same group of languages, they were necessarily of the same race. The confusion began with the observation by the French philologists that the language of the Celts in Brittany, or Midgal, or Celtic speech, as it was naturally called by them, was essentially similar in structure to that of the Britronic or Simri speech of the Welsh, the Simri, right? The Gomori, the Simri, Sumerians, right? To that of the Britonic or Simri speech of the Welsh in the Britain of Brittany in Gaul. This Britonic language was then presumed to be a branch of the Celtic of Gaul and the term Celtic applied to it. All right, so you hear how they were mixing all this stuff. We got a little confused, like, and that they're talking about that video we made about the Sumerians and how they were related to some of the Gauls and Celtics. And this is one way they were mixing languages and people were speaking their language. And so they were mixing their race with them. And a lot of them weren't really Sumeri. They were just really speaking Celtic dialects. So they were all being put under Celt because uh, these Britonic languages, these ancient Britons, right? Again, it says here, it was then presumed to be a branch of the Celtic or Gaul, and the term Celtic applied to it, and then extended in a racial sense to the Welsh people who spoke it. Similarly, the Gaelic or Gaelic speech of the Irish and the Scottish Highlanders was also confounded to have affinity with the Gaelic and Welsh, or Celtic in parentheses, and all the people speaking those languages were also dubbed Celts. You hear what they're pointing out here, which is something I'm understanding now, all right? So I'm glad I read this. All right, a lot of uh, there was an ancient language there that got confused with Celtic because these people spoke this language, they were considered Celts, but they weren't really Celts. Remember, that word is not even part of their language. Summer, so many different nations, you know, so they had different names, they didn't call themselves that. The linguistic affinities on which this racial kingship was assumed were tabulated in two groups by Dr. Latam in 1841, based on the classification by Pritchard and C. Mayer, and this still remains the recognized classification of the Celtic dialects. 
of which the Gaelic is considered to be the more primitive and older, right? So the Gaelic is the oldest of the supposed Celtic dialects. Again, and they're letting us know right here in this chapter that they actually grabbed that old Gaelic and they, they named it or dubbed it Celtic and it really wasn't. So right here it gives us a table that says Celtic group of languages. It says uh, one and two, so Gaelic or Simric and then Gaelic or Erse. So we got the, the Simric or Welsh, uh, number two, Cornish, now extend, and then three, Armorican or Breton, Celtic proper. Then over here, and it says, uh, under the Gaelic or Erse, is the Phoenic or Erse or Irish. And then number two, Gaelic or Highland Scottish. We're going to get into all these nations and languages, try to understand it a lot better. So continuing, it says, still further had the Celtic theory grown apace, this so-called Celtic race was also called Aryan in race. When it was observed that their language was akin to the languages which had latterly been classed as Aryan, this essentially racial title of Aryan had been introduced into English and other European languages by the discovery in 1794 by the erudite Sir William Jones, the chief justice of Calcutta, that the Sankris language of the ancient Hindus who called themselves Arya was radically and structurally of the same type as the old Persian, Greek, Latin, Celtic, English, and German or Tectonic languages of Europe, and that the culture and mythology of the ancient Hindus were essentially analogous to that ancient Greece and Rome and of the gods. Goths, all right? So remember the Persians descend from Elam or their Elamites, right? Elam. Elam was the son of Shem. Remember the table? all right we're still talking about the same people who's what is a greek so called right so who are these people and where do they descend from um now continuing now they're trying to make correlations with the ancient hindus who are the ancient hindus but the nagas right the two ancient nagas who are the nagas the ancient hindus right who also write snake people supposedly and remember earlier they were talking about snake worshiping people over here all right, you see all the correlation. It says the physical appearance also of the pure Hindus claiming to be the descendants of the highly civilized ancient Aryas, Aryas resembled generally that of the North European peoples of Britain and Scandinavia. It was then assumed that the ancient Aryas who civilized India and Persia or Iran and gave them their Aryan speech were presumably the same common racial stock as the ancestors of the civilizers of Greece and Rome in Northern Europe. All right. So again, they said assumed, they assumed, but they're seeing it in reverse. You know, they're seeing all those ancient lands coming out of over there, that fake location that they called Mesopotamia. So that's why there's confusion right now. So this Indo-European stock of people was thus called the Aryan race and the name Aryan was extended also to their several languages and dialects which were classed as Aryan or Indo-European or by upserpent German writers, Indo-Germanic. All right. So again, they're mixing a lot of nations together by language and basically giving these languages false origins. The so-called Celtic languages were called a branch of Aryan speech and the Celts themselves called Aryans. All right. Again, all this in parentheses. In race and to these Celts, the philologists and ethnologists arbitrarily assigned the credit for first introducing the Aryan language and Aryan culture into Alban or Britain and Ireland. This illusionment, however, came in the year 1864 when scientific anthropologists following Anders Retzius, the Swede, had begun to apply exact measurement to the skulls and physical types of the various so-called branches of the Aryan race, as it had been found that the shape of the skull or head form afforded the best of all criterions of race. In that year, Mr. Paul Broca, who had begun four years earlier, a systematic measurement of the head forms of the people of France, published his famous monograph on the head forms of the Celts of Brittany, the descendants of the original Celts or Caesar and the classic writers, he found that so far from these Celts being of the Aryan physical type, namely tall, fair, and long-headed, they were on the contrary a short, darkish, complexioned, and round-headed race. You hear that? 
they're not matching what they were supposed to be looking like. In the next year, 1865, appeared the celebrated collection of measurements of the ethnic types in the British Isles by Davis and Turnham in their Crania Britannica, on which they had been engaged since 1860, and Dr. Debo's papers. This disclosed conclusively that the Celtic-speaking people of the British Isles, and more particularly the Welsh, were also short and dark complexion all right dark complexion more confirmation of the ancient europeans right europeans were swarthy they were so-called negro too you gotta stop thinking all europeans were white you gotta stop thinking when we say europe we talking about white people all right but with long heads or medium long heads and thus were a markedly different racial type of the celts of gaul Whilst their skull form and complexion excluded the greater portion of them from the Aryan racial type and affiliated them to the Iberians. Those startling discoveries by scientific methods excited great commotion amongst the ethnologists and philologists as they disproved their accepted theory that the Celts of Gaul were of the same kindred of the Celts of the British Isles, right? They're different people. You hear this? You guys under understanding? And that both were Aryans, and they're supposed to be all, both Aryans. Whereas it was now disclosed on the contrary that they were of different races, and that they neither were of the Aryan race, although both spoke an Aryan language in different dialects. These scientific results were fully confirmed by further measurements, which were also extended over the greater part of Europe, as these measurements disentangle the British Celts from the continental and also sharply differentiate the Aryan type from both, it is necessarily to glance at their leading results, which are here displayed in the accompanying table and illustrated in figure 22. All right, it says here racial types in Europe. Real quick, it says this shows three main racial types in the population of modern Europe, all three of which we shall find represented in Britain, namely the Aryan or Nordic or Northern, tall, fair, broad, broad, long or longish heads. When they say fair, you got to also be careful and not think just white, Alpine or Celtic, continental is number two or Germanic, and then short statured fair or darkish broad, brown, round or broad hair that's them and then three is iberian or mediterranean shortish stature dark narrow browed long face long heads and including the prehistoric riverbed type of the pigs the best of the distinguishing criterions of race is the head index and second column of table in conjunction with color all right so you know we gotta dodge the hijack when we're talking about this craniology because it was based on trying to make you know make people less intelligent than others you know so but either way, they're literally, they're showing you, this can't really determine skin complexion either. They just know, you know, they can't say the Aryans are fair or white, you know, that's conjecture. The first of these racial types of Europe, the Nordic or Northern, which is the Aryan type, is now mostly restricted to Northern Western Europe. It included most of the classic Greeks and Romans as evidenced by their sculptures and paintings and skeletal remains. It comprises a considerable element of the present day population in the British Isles. The Scandinavians or Norsemen, including Swedes and many Danes, and a small proportion of the people of France and the Rhine Valley, where, however, the skulls of the older burials show that the civilizers of Germany, like the Jutes, the Jutes, and the Anglo Saxons were of this type. And I shall show that the early Britons and Scots, properly so called, as well as the Goths, belonged to this Aryan type, which was also the type of Eastern or Indo Persian branch of the Aryans the Barat Katiya and the Kati or Hittites and Phoenicians. All right. You see what he's letting you know. The second of the Celtic or so-called Alpine Swiss extended from Brittany to Switzerland also comprised a major type in the Rhine Valley and the Slav or Serb people of mid Europe, including two Prussians, Poles and a large proportion of the Russians. Remember, these are dark skinned people and an appreciable element amongst the people of the East Coast of Britain derived from the Bronze Age Hun invaders of prehistoric Alban in the later Stone Age who were essentially of this round-headed type. The third type is of essential interest in regard to the British Celtic question and the dark racial element by which the Celtic language is chiefly spoken in the British Isles. This type is generally known as Iberian from one of its old seats 
Iberia or Spain, and it was given the wider syn syn synonym of Pelasgic, but it is now generally called Mediterranean after Sergius nomenclature, as it is found in modern Europe, mainly along the sea basin from Spain to Greece and its archipelago to Asia Minor. It is essentially of the same type as the prehistoric stone age inhabitants of the British Isles and the riverbed type of Huxley, and it's also substantially the same type which is found in many of the long barrels or long grave mounds alongside the Aryan type there. And it still forms a substratum of the modern head form in the British Isles. It thus appears that the titles Hibernia for Ireland and Hebrides, all right, Eber and Hebrides, Hebrews, Hebrides, Ireland for Ireland, Hibernia, Eber, Ireland for the Western Isles are probably survivals of the Iberia title for the primitive stock with which first peopled the British Isles in the Stone Age. Indeed, the Irish Gauls or Gaels or Fini claim origin from the sons of Milad or Miled, which is said to be Milesia in Spain, Iberia. And in describing the later colonization of Erin, they say that a leading chief of the later Gaed Hel Miled immigrants was called Eber, which appears to preserve this Iberian title, Eber of the Hebrews, right? Remember, Eber is feather. It goes down to pinion, Ebra. They spread themselves through Erin to her coast. Eber, the god Hel, took the south of Erin, or Erin. In consequence of these discoveries by anthropologists, that the Celts belong to the non-Aryan round-headed race and the resultant paradox that the so-called British and Irish Celts were not Celts and that were no Celts in Britain, the leading anthropologists recognizing the logic of facts gave up the use of misleading terms Celts and Celtic in a racial sense in regards to British Isles and restricted these terms to the round-headed Celts or Gaul according to the designation of these people in the classics and even the term Aryan tended to drop out of use in a racial sense when no historical trace of the early Aryans in Europe could be discovered. And when it was found by M.D. Quatrefages and others that the physical type, not only of the Prussians, who also, but also the prevailing type of the Germans, who had posed as being the leading Aryan civilizers of Europe, was Slavic and thus non-Aryan. They now recognized more clearly than before the fact that mere language is by itself no criterion of race, all right? Just like you speak English, don't make you English, right, from England. So again, language is by itself no criterion of race, and that kinship in language does not necessarily imply kinship in race, as so many conquered races are observed to have adopted, all right, or to have imposed on them the language of their overlords of a totally different race, as Huxley observed, no one could call a Negro of America, either English or Aryan, in race merely because he spoke the Aryan English speech, like I just said. And as has been well said, there is no such thing as a French race, but rather many races speak in French. No Italian race, but rather many races speak in Italian. No Germanic race, but rather many races speak in German. You get it? You can't generalize letting you know and we may add there is no such thing as the english race but rather many races and mixed races living in the same political unity under the same laws and speaking the english language the philologists of the other hand on the other hand sorry for whom the celtic theory seems to have possessed a fatal fascination still clung and do cling to the title celtic for the language spoken in the british isles by the gals of scotland in Ireland and by the Simri of Wales and the diehard Celtist still give it a racial sense and speak of the British Celtic speakers of the black Celts and of the Celtic temperament and of the kilt as the garb of old Gaul and of the Celtic origin of the Aryan language in Britain. All right, so they're, letting, they're pointing out how these people are kind of like leaving a lot out, you know, in their studies they, when they're talking about generalizing people on their Celt. Remember, they didn't even have that word in their language. Thus, 
they thus keep alive the old mental confusion and misled the public and popular writers. Thus, we have the latest writer in history, Mr. Wells, misled into writing the jargon that the Celtic invasion of Britain was by tall and fair people and Nordic Celts. You see, that was false. And that it is even doubtful if the north of England is more Aryan than pre-Celtic in blood. With such conflicting uses of the term Celtic in circulation, even some anthropologists occasionally lapse into reference to the Celts of the British Isles and to the Celts as a branch of the Aryan race, who then are the race in Britain called Celts, all right? By our later day writers, who are they then? So they're different peoples. No traditional historical reference or record whatsoever exists of the migration of any people called Celts into early Britain, all right? There's no history of that there, really. Anthropologists from their exact measurements of the people in Britain tell us that the darkest population forms of the nucleus of each of the Celtic language areas, darkest populations, which now remain and this dark Celtic speaking element and especially found in the Grampian Hills in Scotland, the wild and mountainous Wales and Cornwall in the hills of Connemara and Kerry in Western Ireland, right? These dark Celtic people and their average stature is relatively short culminating in Britain and South Wales the Severn, Severn Valley and Cornwall it will thus be noticed that this Celtic area corresponds generally in Scotland with the area in which the later Picts suddenly disappeared and in whose place have suddenly appeared the people called Celts all right all of a sudden the Picts disappeared then you got these Celts you see what they're letting you know here you understand just like they said, the Maya disappeared, then you got some other people, all right? Paper genocide. In Ireland, also, the Celtic area generally corresponds with that part of the country, especially associated with the Bonds, the Vans, or early Fiends, who we have found were pigs, all right? These were dark-skinned people. Cornwall, with his old tin port of Ictis or Victis, was a chief Celtic, in parentheses, center for the old Sea of Each, or the Picts, all right? These are all Pict lands. And the Picts appear to have called themselves Chaldees. They were the Chaldees or the Chaldees, all right? Again, I know it was a long introduction to this chapter before we can get to the juicy part, but they had to break something down to you. You get what they're saying? They never, the, the real ancient, ancient people that were in these lands, like the Picts, had nothing to do with Gaelic or the Simri or any of those other people that came in later with their languages. And then they were labeled under that, like Celtic and Aryan and all that, just because they ended up speaking those languages. But these people called themselves Chaldees or Chaldees, switch to K with a C, or Chaldees or Chaldees, remember? Kesedet, Chaldees, or through the fire, Chaldic, through the fire. This new line of evidence leads us to the conclusion that the early Celts or Celts were presumably the early Picts calling themselves Chaldees or Chaldees, a primitive people who I find from a mass of evidence were the early Chaldees. They were the early Chaldean people. Again, Ireland of Ireland, right? Or of the Chaldees. Chaldees, remember Abraham, who the Chaldees in the Bible, they're supposed to be somewhere else in Iraq over there. They lied to us. All right, they confused us a lot. They mixing up nations and languages together. They did all that on purpose. A lot of layers we got to uncover, but we'll do it slowly, right? But surely, all right? They called themselves the Chaldees or the Galati and the Gali of Van in Eastern Asia Minor, Mesopotamia in the Stone Age, all right? Remember, he says it has to be them. He's letting you know the same ones from the Bible. That's them. The same ones from supposedly Asia Minor, Mesopotamia. Dodge the hijack. It wasn't over there. Remember, Canaan. The real Mesoamerica or the cradle of civilization was in America. All right, but he's letting you know this author, another source, that these Chaldees or Picts, the Picts were ancient Chaldees, the ancient Chaldees of Mesopotamia. Their Western hordes would seem to have retained their title of Chaldees or Galati or Gal when in the Old Stone Age they penetrated westward into Gal on the Atlantic and formed there the primitive Celts or Celti or Gal and of Pictavia. Remember, they came from the Atlantic, Pictavia, or the border of Iberia, and the Gauls and Gaul are actually called Galati and Galat by Strabo. All right, again, Chaldeans, 
and at a later period when the round-headed Sarmatian of Alpines invaded Gaul from the Rhine in Switzerland and drove out the pigs, they seem to have retained the old double original name for that land and its people, Gaul. All right, they drove out who the Sarmatians, remember the Simri, the Sumerians, the Sumerians, remember, check out my video, part two, nations of the world, who the Sumerians, these are the same people they're talking about, the Sarmatians, and Caltis, Celt or Celt. So they're saying that they came they invaded them or drove them out or maybe you know assimilated amalgamated with them enslaved them or whatever ran them out and they kept the names of those people there though like Gaul and Caltis Celt or Celt Caltis Chaldees yet although in Britain the name Celt or Celt does not appear in the fragmentary surviving history of ancient Britain under that exact spelling it nevertheless is represented in this dialectic variant of Caled in Caledon and in the Kuldees, right? Or like Caledonians, right? Kuldees or Chuldees, Chaldees, and the title of the Pictish, Pictish mission of Columba. It may possibly survive also in Godhel, the common Gaelic speaking of Gael, by transposition of the letters and spelling a recognized dialectic change called Paronomasia of an earlier Galdi representing Kaldi or Kaldi, all right? Now that's deep. Right, like the uh, Muslim and the Quran, how they were referring to the Chaldeans as Chaldee, Chaldee, Chaldean. Remember, through the fire, remember, Abraham went through the fire, and its shortened form, Gal, possibly survives in Gael and in Ga Gualia and for Wales. So, after all, perhaps the British Celts are more entitled to use the Celt title than the round-headed Celts of Gaul, who according to classic historians and anthropologists are the only true Celts. This identity of the ancestors of the British Celts or Celts with the Chaldees or Caleds, Chalets, Chaldees or Pigs, in keeping with the physical traits and head form of the latter, the people of the Celtic speaking areas are preponderantly of the dark long narrow headed narrow face smaller statured iberian type of the chaldees or pigs chaldees or the chaldees or pigs chaldees or pigs and this is also the prevailing type of the substratum of the people throughout the british isles the modern british Celts, however as well as the bulk of their kindred still forming the main substratum in the population of the Brit british isles generally have become a somewhat heterogeneous race through more or less intermixture with the other two races of later invaders and civilizers. Thus, the original dark, aboriginal, Pictish, dark, the dark who's the Picts. All right, a lot of your surnames are actually Pictish, ancient Pictish surnames, Gaelic, ancient. Look at that. They're talking about your family here. All right, Pictish, Chaldean, Chaldees, Chaldees. Remember, these are all sons of Shem. Remember, these are all sons of Arfashat. The Chaldeans are Arfashat's kids. All right, the son of Shem. And they were what? Dark Aboriginal Pictish or Iberian stock has been mixed more or less on the East Coast and Midlands with the non-Aryan, round-headed and broad-browed fair Alpine or Slav or Hun invaders from the time of the beaker using men of the late Stone Age, about 2000 BC onwards. And later, over all the British Isles, they have been mixed more or less with the Aryan rulers and civilizers, the tall, long-headed, broad browed broad-browed, sorry, fair northern invaders, the Britons and Scots, properly so-called with their later kindred Anglo-Saxons, Norse and Normans, as a result of this partial intermixing during many centuries, which is discussed in a later chapter on the mixing of the races, there have arisen several intermediate or composite types, many of the British Celts, does now possess a considerable strain of Aryan blood, manifesting itself in physical traits and especially in lighter color of their hair and eyes, whilst fondly ideal idealizing their Celtic ancestry into a sentimental cult. But the major portion of the population, not only in the modern Celtic areas, but also over the British Isles, generally retain appreciably a preponderating Pictish type they still dark they still there they still aboriginals all right thus in regard to the civilization of the british isles we find that the modern theory that it was the british Celts who first introduced the aryan language and civilization into brain is merely a survival of unfounded assumptions by later philologists 
which assumptions rested on the further unfounded assumption that the British Celts were originally Aryan in race. All right, that was false. Hope you guys understood that in this chapter. That was a great breakdown on it for us to continue, you know, so we can, you know, pull out the babies, you know, chew the meat, spit out the bones, and uh, do, you know, come with our own conclusions from what we're going to continue reading. All right. We are now in a position to take up on much clearer ground. All right. Just like I was just saying, that has then has hitherto been possible for previous inquirers. The great and hitherto unsolved question as to how and when the Aryan language and civilization were first introduced into Britain by what racial agency. So I just want to show you, we're going to get into all this when we get into the Britain's uh, video. This is chapter 13. I mean, all the chapters here are good, but just an example. I mean, the title says coming of the Britons. Remember, these are the ones that invaded the Pictish people or Aryan Brito Phoenicians under King Brutus the Trojan to Albion. All right. So that's that's how deep it is. But I'm glad uh, we read uh, this uh, chapter in this book again. These Chaldees, these ancient Celtic are actually pigs who are calling themselves the Chaldees or the Chaldees, who cool deeds, the Chaldees of so-called the Bible of Mesopotamia, the Chaldees, same people. This was the book Phoenician Origin of Britons and Scots and Anglo-Saxons by L.A. Waddell. We're going to get more into this book later on. All right, so we continue again in this book, uh, Ireland or of the Chaldees. Again, Ireland, or of the Chaldees by Anna Wilkes. And again, this book is from 1873. A lot of great sources and footnotes. And we're in chapter six of this book. I remember we have already read the first five chapters. Check out the previous video if you haven't. And this chapter says the cross, a Chaldean symbol. The cross as a symbol is traceable to the crossed rods of the Chaldean shepherd kings. These symbols are found all over the three kingdoms, especially in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and Cornwall. The cross is an anci as ancient as the fish and the serpent signs, and as the ring and the cup cut in to be seen on the stones of Scotland and Ireland. Besides the cross being found upon Egyptian, Babylonian, and Assyrian monuments, we find it was worshipped in Mexico ages before the introduction of Christianity, large stone crosses, says Prescott and his conquest of Mexico volume 1 page 242 being erected probably to the god of rain I remember who the god of rain was that was Quetzalcoatl a cross being erected to Quetzalcoatl come on Quetzalcoatl who's Quetzalcoatl huh Jehawashi now remember so this is a future video I'm gonna do about the cross in the ancient world and how it's not just a symbol for Christianity and Jesus, right? It has something to do with there's a deeper symbology behind the cross. And a lot of, of the old world nations had the cross and they found it all over America. Like it's telling you here, large stone crosses dedicated to the God of Rain, Quetzalcoatl, right? Colonel Wilford and his Asiatic Researchers, volume 10, page 124, alluding to the cross says, though it is not an object of worship among the Bod Bodhas or Buddhists, it is favorite emblem and device among them. It is exactly the cross of the money chance with leaves and flowers springing from it. Mr. Morris and his Indian antiquities notices the druid and the cross. He says, it is a fact not less remarkable than well attested that the druids in their groves were accustomed to select the most stately and most beautiful tree as an emblem of the deity they adored. And having cut the side branches, they affixed two of the largest of them to the highest part of the trunk in such a manner that those branches extended on each side like the arms of a man and together with the body presented the appearance of a huge cross. And on the bark in several places was also inscribed the letter Tau, the Tau cross, you see the X. As we find that the Christian emblem was general among the Druids, no one need fear assigning to many of the crosses of Ireland and Scotland a period far interior to the introduction of Christianity. Evidently, the inhabitants of Erin, previous to the arrival of St. Patrick, were well acquainted with the cross as a symbol of the realization of a hope 
we are not attributing their acquaintance with the cross to the knowledge they undoubtedly had of Christianity before St. Patrick's time, impressed upon them probably for ages by their Druids and teachers. When the Apostle of Ireland went there, the people believed him, for he taught no new doctrine. He only brought them knowledge that the sacrifice was complete in their person of the Son of God. Accordingly, the fire of their altars was put out and serpent veneration died away. The same effect was produced upon the people of Britain. When St. Augustine landed in Tanet, he came bearing a silver crucifix above him and his companions around singing litanies upon which the people fell on their knees and believed the gospel. So listen to what they're saying. They were using their own their own symbols against them. Just like they came here and they brought the cross, but we had the cross here already for different things. That symbol was here already, anciently. Just like it was here in Pickland or with these ancient Chaldees, right? St. Andrew's cross, in a like way, was the sign accepted by the Kuldees of Scotland. The Kuldees, the Chuldees, Kuldees, the Chuldees of Scotland, the pigs, right? The men of Israel. Bran, Sifin, Elite, and Fagan, who returned from Rome in the year 57 AD to Wales, brought intelligence by the sign of the cross of the Redeemer crucified and the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, and they were accordingly acknowledged by the Welsh as voracious teachers. When the cross returned to Chaldea and Ur, all right, and the adjacent countries from the east, the people had no difficulty in accepting it. These few remarks we hope are sufficient to show that the cross is much older than is generally believed. Uh, all right, so we continue again in the book, Ireland or Ur of the Chaldees by Anna Wilkes, 1873. This is chapter seven of the book. It's called The Sons of Noah and Their Descendants. It says here that Orthodox teachers tell us that Noah, sometime after his release from the ark, planted a vine. But where he planted the vine is left to conjecture. There's a great man mentioned in Welsh tradition called Hugh, the mighty. And this Hugh, for other reasons, besides having planted a vineyard in Gascony, all right, listen to that, is by the Welsh believed to be identical with Noah. All right. It is true that who does not sound very like Noah, but the same may be said of the Chaldean Noah, who is called Jesus. Whether who Gadern, according to the triads, the leader of the three Pacific tribes of the families of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, was the same person as Noah, Duivan, and Nut, is not to be perhaps satisfactorily proven, but we will not try to prove it, for we wish only to show that Celtic traditions point to the mariners of the Ark as having been with the first state of things in Western Europe, and the actual originators of Asiatic kingdoms subsequent to their sojourn in Europe, particularly in the British Isles. But because the Irish and Welsh are in the habit of tracing their genealogies up to Noah, all right, it's a habit, it's, it's part of their history, it's part of their genealogy and traditions and oral history. So are the Hebrews accustomed, just like the Hebrews, huh? We do not mean to say that these genealogies are entirely to be relied upon we are only now alluding to one of the Celtic customs being common to the Hebrew. Again, we're not trying to say specifically, but we're trying to show correlation here that the Celtic, they, their whole stories and legends and all these people, like when we say Celtic, remember the last chapter, the last book we read, we're talking about the ancient, these ancient people of Scotland and the British Isles, Ireland, all right? Their whole history, their whole mythology, their whole tradition goes back to he Noah, all right? There was no particular and enduring distinction between him and the Celt. Ancient Britain and Ireland, we assume to have been places of sojourn of Noah and his sons. Therefore, the religion of the Hebrews may re reasonably be expected to have been the same as that of the Druids. Remember, it's not about religions, all right? There are two, the present day, families of the name of Noah to be found in England. Of course, some might say this is no uninterrupted inheritance of the name, only a coincidence to be explained by many causes other than a distinct Noahic source. But it is quite probable because the Hebrews and the Celts were once the same. Again, because the Hebrews and the Celts were once the same. I remember sons of Shem, 
that the name has remained here. The name Hugh, or Hugh, as it is now spelled, right? You see that last name Hugh, where it comes from? It comes from Noah. According to the Welsh, the other names for Noah is to be counted by thousands in the three kingdoms. No one is bold enough to affirm that this name is a foreign importation, Roman, Danish, or Saxon. The name is to be found as Hugh, or Hughes, up Hugh, Machua, and Pew. Says here, section one, Japheth. Now it says, the seven sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, and Dodanam are traced by Josephus into Europe. He shows that their habitations were situated as follows. Beginning at the mountains, Taurus and Amanus, they proceeded along Asia as far as the river Tanais and along Europe to Cadiz and settling themselves on the lands which they light upon, which none had inhabited before. They called the nations by their own names. For Gomer founded those whom the Greeks now call Galatians or Gauls. Now remember, these were the Simri. And remember, it's not the same. These Gauls or Galatians are not the same as the ancient, but we just read in the last book, so let's not get confused again. But at least we got a reference now of who the Sumerians mixed with and how they became known as Gauls. You know, so remember, I have a video on this very thorough video actually on the descendants of Japheth and uh, spec spec specifying on the Sumerians too. And that's part two of my Nations of the World uh, series. So go ahead and check that out if you haven't. All right. It says Magog founded those that from him were named Magogites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. All right. So we got to dash the hijack. Now, as to Javan and Madai, the sons of Japheth, from Madai came the Maldeans, who are called Medes by the Greeks, but from Javan, Ionia, and all the Grecians are derived. Tobel founded the Tobelites, who are now called Iberes, and the Moshosheni were founded by Moshok, now they are Cappadocians. Of the three sons of Gomer, as Shanax founded the Ashkenazians, I remember Ashkenaz, that's the time about the Ashkenazis, the Ashkenaz founded the Ashkenazis, right? They're Japheth, right? They're not from Shem, the Ashkenazi, who are now called by the Greeks Reginians or Reginians. So did Repav found the Rephians, now called Paphlogians, right? Same people of these Ashkenazis, all right? And Trugrama and the Trugramians, who as the Greeks resolved were named Pherians. Of the three sons of Javan, also the son of Japheth, Elisha gave name to the Elysians, who were his subjects. They are now the Aeolians, Tarsus to the Tarsians, for so was Cilicia of old called the sign of which is that the noblest city they have, and a metropolis also is Tarsus, the Tau, being by change put the Teta. Because this account seems to us to reconcile with truth a good deal of what we have advanced in support of the names of places and people mentioned in the Old Testament being traceable through Europe, so we will leave it without comment that it not, in our opinion, required to be viewed with a caution that comes of what we conceive to be more correct. The sons of Shem and Ham were with the sons of Japheth or before or shortly after them in europe whence they in part entered asia more of this after if japheth was as we cannot doubt the elder son of noah his family may be taken to be the oldest in the world so the celtic or irish or simric language which could not then have changed much and the manners customs and the antiquities of europe are the oldest in the world i remember the Simbric and ancient, ancient, ancient pigs, they're not the same people. Because they, again, we write in the last book that the pigs were eventually grouped as Celts, right? And they became known as Celts and they got grouped with, with these Simri that invaded, that came in much later. All right? So they're not the same people when they're talking about them here. The most ancient Greek and Roman writers agree to allow the Celts or Simri or Gomeridae to have been the primogenital family but they are right about these people being very old and again my nations of the world part two talks goes heavy into them they're the same as the sumerians um you know but they're not the same as the ancient picts not the same as the ancient british or irish people so they wouldn't be the same people here 
south of the Caucasian range, we find that the Simri were called Gomrai. So it may be that the name Crimea is a corruption of the word Simri. It is alleged by some that this section of the Simri allied themselves with the children of Madai and became the Medes of history, and that another portion of them separating from the main body became Parthis, who in process of time became the Parthians or later Persians. I remember Persians. Now they're saying in part because they don't sure, but they're a little bit sure because they did mix with these people. So the Persians were originally Elamites from Elam. Elam was his son of Shem. And these people did mix in with these Parthians of Simri or Gomarians, all right? And then they became as a people together Persians, but it was originally Elamites, all right? Founded and started with Elam, the the son of Shem. Another division of these people moving along the chain of the Apennines became the Simbri or Humbri or Umbri of Italy. These were the main stock which the Roman Confederacy was formed, made up of Latin, Sanit, Sabine, Marcian, and other nations. The Saturnian or Golden Age was during the Umbrian Empire of Italy, 1200 BC, the patriarchs of Umbria, both regal and priestly, became the gods of Roman mythology. The termination of words in Celtic and Latin differ, but it is curious how the root forms of the Latin are discoverable to be Celtic. The proper names of the oldest Latin families are formed on the Celtic basis, thus Claudius, Catullus, Cato, Pompeius, Lucullus, Camillus, Marcus, and the sewers of the Umbrian Rome and the Cyclopean fortresses and the temples were erected by Umbrian kings. The religion of the Umbrians was the Druidical or Patriarchal, the Tuscan or Etrurian Empire followed and was composed of the same Celtic element. The Etrurian may be said to have given way to the Gaelic uh, interruptions of Brinus and Bellinus. From the very earliest times, the country of the descendants of Gomer was known as Galatia, for Gomer founded those whom the Greeks now Josephus time called Galatians or Gauls. The most remarkable portion of the Galatia alluded to by Josephus were Caledonia or Galedonia and Gaul and the province of Galatia and Spain. The Welsh of the present day pride themselves upon being sons of Gomer. There are many families of the names in England, but they are chiefly to be found in Wales. Again, remember, they're mixing a lot of these nations. They did end up going to uh, U Europe, the British Isles, Ireland, Scotland, these Simri, uh, the sons of Gomer. They did end up assimilating and bringing their religion and languages and beliefs and all their history into the pig's land and absorbing them and making them, you know, basically go extinct from history not as a people but almost like a paper genocide back then they invaded them they made them you know take on all their languages and that's why again it was a good to read the book we read before all right so again i'm glad i read that book before i have a little more better understanding how a simri a sumerian from Japheth could be considered these gals or celts and i had that had me confused when i did that in uh, video i knew there was more mixture in there i just knew it it was more mixture wasn't just clearly them and i knew they had assimilated with other people to be become the celts and gauls and this is a, a clear example so i'm glad we got that perspective kind of cleared up a little bit we're actually going to go more into that definitely now i was going to talk about the descendants of magog so again that was the gomer uh descendants so we're going to talk about magog it says it is not only general valency that makes allusion to the irish being descendants of magog there is frequent mention made of this fact in the history of traditions of Ireland, Magog or Sons of the North, as his name signifies, as in many scriptures references associated with the Isles of the Sea. Now, Javan, another son of Japheth is Javan, the Ja modified into E in Welsh, the name becomes Even or Evans, one of the most numerous family names in Wales. All right, you see that? Ashkenes, this Galatian son of Gomer, has been traced to Germany. Ascanians, all right, so that was one of the the groups right one of the celtic groups that were breaking down from germany switzerland that had a different type of uh skull they were different than the actual pigs all right so remember these are different people even though eventually they assimilated together and the pigs had to be called or, or take on their customs and be called celts and all this other stuff all right so ashkenes again the galatian son of goma has been traced to germany ascanians the ancient germans were called and known as such by the saxons Askinis or Ashkinis is yet a proper name in Germany. 
It says Ripath, this other son of Gomer, like Javan or Ivan, seems to have bequeathed his name nearly in an altered form to the present Griffith of Wales. Togama, the people of Togama, and his bands, invariably associated with Gog and Magog, are the people of the northern quarters, Scandinavia, and particularly Russia. All right, it says Eliza. Eliza was the son of Javan. Josephus says he gave name to the Elysians who were his subjects. They became the Aeolians. The Eleusinian mysteries originated with the sons of Elisa. To turn to the name as it is found in the British islands, there are people called Elisa, or as the Welsh give it, Elias, hence the names Ellis, Ellison, and Elisa, and Elias were favorite names with the Hebrews, as may be seen in 1 Kings, it says here, chapter 22, 6, and chapter 19, 16, and Ezekiel uh, 22, 7. There is mention made of the Isles of Eliza. It says Tarshish, another son of Javan, was Tarshish, that the portion of Iberia, Spain, called Tarshish, was named from his son of Javan, Josephus, as we have shown beliefs. When Josephus wrote, Tarshish must have been, from his remarks, a place of some note, but the Bible references to it prove this. Silver spread into plates is brought into Tarshish. Tarshish was dyed merchant with iron, Ezekiel. The ships of Tarshish shall sing of the tire in thy market ezekiel um 27 uh 25 and jonah rose up to flee unto tarshish this is jonah 1 uh, 3 all king solomon's drinking vessels were of gold and all the vessels of the house of the forest of lebanon were of pure gold none were of silver it was nothing accounted of in the days of solomon for the king had a sea of navy of tarshish once in three years came the navy of tarshish bringing gold and silver, ivory, and apes, and peacocks. This is in 1 Kings 21, oh, 1 Kings 10, 21, and 22. Now we go into uh, Dodana. That's another son. It says, This, the last son of Javan and a Galatian, seems not to have left his name so as to be clearly discerned in these times. Nevertheless, it is capable of fair interpretation. Isaiah says, OG, traveling companies of Dedani. This is in uh, Isaiah 21, 13, with evident reference to a nomad but yet semi-civilized people who several centuries before this settled in ireland called the tuatetanan all right that sounds almost like the tribe of dan so they're like mixing a lot of these danites uh most likely with the sons of gomer and that did happen all right the sons of japhet as we have shown are constantly referred to in the prophets as the inhabitants of the isles isles and in genesis 5 10 we find by these were the Isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. All right, so we continue in the book, Ireland, Ur of the Chaldees by Anna Wilkes from 1873. And we're in chapter eight. In chapter eight says the sons of Ham and his descendants in Western Europe, prophecy against the Isles and retrospect of Habakkuk. All right. So again, you know, we touch the hijack and we get the babies out. All right. All right. So it says the evidence that the children of Noah dwelled together before the division of the time of Peleg is sufficient to warrant our looking for traces of this son of Noah in the country of Gomer's posterity. Ham is described as the father of Canaan. The word Ham, which abounds in the British Isles, in the name of localities and families, almost identifies the Isles of the Sea as a portion of the Hamath of Isaiah. The city of Hamona and the valley of Hamon, Gog, with which it is mentioned in Ezekiel 39, was situated in these islands. The word Gog is associated with places in Britain. Hamon Gog interpreted through the Welsh means literally Northampton, Gog means North, and Ham bears its own signification. According to some of the old maps, an example of which is appended to Dr. Skeen's edition of the four ancient books of Wales, Pridian e Goglid means the northern division of Britain. The north of England, including the lowlands of Scotland, was at one time in 
possession of the Welsh, which may account for this distinction being preserved. Northmen are called Gord Goglet, or the men of the north, so the Norwegian Norsemen and the Norman, the latter name being given to the men of the north of France, who went there under royal the Dane. In some parts of England, the word ham is yet preserved by itself ham. In Glamour's Danshire, and East and West Ham, near London. Again, we have North and South Hampton, Hampstead in Staffordshire, Hampton near London, and names of people, Ham, Hampson, Hammond, Hammond, Hamish, and perhaps Hamilton. Ham was the father of Canaan. A place derived of this name is Cana, one of the islands of the Hebrides, perhaps the Cane of Ezekiel 28, 23, mentioned in connection with Eden and Haram. Cain Mar, a mountain in North Wales, seems also to have retained name. As to the names of people, there are many. Cain, Keen, Keen, Cain, 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 Du, Cain, and Khan. The son of Canaan was Cush. There are some who believe that there are traces of Cush in Ireland. The supposed Cushite remains there are considered by antiquaries to be of great importance towards the elucidation of great prehistoric people. Cushandal and Cushenden, both in Ireland, are with Midian or Madian spoken of in Habakkuk 3 7, and they are to be identified as the Cushan and Midian of Habakkuk. Kushandal is in the neighborhood of the Akkads, all right? The Akkads or the Akkadians, Akkadia. The old name for Mith, according to Irish authorities, was Midhi or Midian. Kushandal is situated near Meath, but may not have been a part of the old Meath province of Ireland. Timon, Timora, may also have been situated there. Timora, Tamari. In connection with Kush, we now refer more generally to Ireland inspirational utterances in the forms of visions of the past as well as prophecies distinguish Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Habakkuk. Their prophecies were not more remarkable than their retrospections. The words of Habakkuk 3, 2, 7 are an example of retrospect. The prophecies against the Isles had been fulfilled, and he sublimely says, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hands, and there was the hiding of his, his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. Of fiction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was the thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride up on, upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked, according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy words, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers, the mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of the thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. We have quoted Habakkuk to this length because there is much more in his words than the sublime. Geologists speak of disturbed formations, for they find the primitive rock uppermost, and the great mystery of the formation of the Irish bog has never yet been solved. Vast deposits, miles in extent of dark vegetable and animal matter, containing forests of oak and other trees with burnt, charred roots, many in a horizontal position, would seem to tell of the fire of the Lord and re remind us of the burning coals that went forth at his feet. Strange bones of men and animals, oak canoes, jewels bearing strange characters, gold and silver ornaments in great quantity are found in these deposits and assure us of a great earthquake having occurred there. The loads 
the mountains, the great caves of which Fingal is but one, tell us of a convulsion which the scripture records thread over and over again. The Bible reminds us of several earthquakes. One of the most remarkable is that which was in the 27th year of Isaiah, king of Judah, says here BC 787, that's the hijack. Zechariah and Amos speak of it. It is recorded in the annals of Ulster that an earthquake at one time overthrew over 56 of their round towers, drove us under the nation, says Habakkuk. May it not be that the allusion here is to the British islands cut from the continent of Europe? Look at the map of Europe, and while remembering the kindred races of the French, Spanish, Old British, Welsh, Irish, and Erse, and the antiquities of each, it is impossible but to be struck with the words of the prophet. Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? These are words that follow the description of Kushan and affliction, or affliction and the trembling of the land of Midian. Who can say that they were not intended to describe the separation of Great Britain and Ireland from the mainland of the continent by the interposition of river and sea? All right, so that's a deep one. They're like, oh, why are they talking about that, huh? Think about that. And it says, Alaphon, the son of Bre Brelaeus, was a very kind king in word and action, and also a bard of transcendent compositions. A tremendous earthquake occurred in his time until the mountains and rocks were rent and the rivers being diverted from their beds ran through the chasms of the ground. This is a paragraph from the Iolo manuscript and the note upon the earthquake mentioned in it is subjoined. Cambridge British traditionary records commemorate many violent convulsions of the earth that seem to have occurred too far back in antiquity to admit of the, any chronological computation of their real periods Still other testimonies aided by natural appearances and geological comparisons frequently tend to verify those immemorial events. Druidical mythology, Welsh Prize essay on the Coelburn, page 7, says that the Almighty, when neither life nor being existed, save himself, vocalized his name, and consequently that all animated nature sprang simultan simultaneously to light and life at the infably melodious sound, thus transmitting to futurity a magnificent reference to the creation. The awful bursting of the lake of floods that deluged the world and drowned all living things except Dui Fan and Dui Fak, the man and woman of God, who escaped in the bald ship and by their offspring repeopled the world is another recorded tradition of the deluge, all right? That's an, an Irish mythology, in Druid, right? Which is sustained by an additional Celtic version of the event that probably appertained to the aborigines of the island, for among the three arduous works of the island of Britain is named the ship of Nafit, Lord of Lords, that carried in it a male and female of every living creature. When the lake of floods burst, the mighty occurrences thus recorded would probably have only been retained as the imaginings of erratic genius were they not elucidated by the mosaic accounts independently of the mythologies and varied forms of perhaps all other nations, kindreds, and tongues of the earth in nearer association with the effects of the earthquake attributed in the text to this reign may be quoted the 67th triad the three subordinate islands of the islands of Britain, the Isle of Orkney, Ork, the Isle of Man, and the Isle of Wit, or White. Afterwards, the land was so rent by the sea that Mong Anglisi became an island. And in the same manner, Orkney was rent into a multitude of islands, and other parts of Alban or Scotland and Cambria became islands. The testimony of this triad is supported by Mark, the hermit's copy of Ninius, where the following passage occurs, tres magnas insulas habet quarumuna australis. All right, so that's Latin. Now right, let's get to the English. It says, It, Britain, has three great islands, one toward the south, opposite the Armorican shore, the Armorican, the Armorican shore, called White, or Wit, the second situated mid sea between Ireland and Britain, called Eubonia or Man, and the third to the extreme north of the British boundary beyond the peaks named Orkney. An ancient proverb 
quoted by the same venerable author as applicable to the rule of the paramount monarchs of the island, affords further corroboration. Judicavit Britannium, Contribus Insulus, he ruled over Britain and its three islands. From the construction of the foregoing triad, it is pretty clear that it later clause is merely a commentary appended by some remote transcriber to account for the altered appearance of the Orkneys after the rupture. And we may fairly conclude also that the triads were among the ancient traditions and ancient books from which Ninius professes to have drawn his information ex traditione veterum, ex antiquis libris nostrorum, the third triad of the Hemgut series gives like the facsimile prefix to Gunn's translation of the Historia 28 as the number of ancient British cities. Although some of the names vary in these records, different copies, however, have extended the number of 33 and 35. The extraordinary bed of the Avon from the Bristol to the Severn is evidently a, as an immense cleft formed by some tremendous convulsion and Caer Ordonnant, the city of the Rif River, the Welsh name of that ancient city, seems to support the hypothesis. All right, so they're talking about how the, all this evidence of something big happening there. All right. Whether this rupture was produced by an earthquake, similar to that recorded in the text or by volcanic eruption, cannot now be determined further than that the agency of the latter may be rationally inferred from the proximity of Brandon Hill to it. I am informed by persons who have examined the district that the original course of the Avon through the Somershire from Nelsey near Bristol to its confluence with the Severn at Clevedon may still be traced. The above is appended to the genealogy of Eastin, the son of Gerwargan, Prince of Glamorgan, together with a short account of the accomplishments and achievements of the several princes. It includes the I.O. Olo manuscripts, pages 340 to 341. Now it says here, the Psalms, as well as the books of the prophets, are full of allusions to this great convulsion accompanied by fire, a great shaking in the land of Israel, and the fire of the Lord may be understood as the disturbed formations, volcanic actions, and of modern uh, geologists. The Quran refers to the inhabitants of the wood near Median as having been destroyed, and uh, of lofty towers that were thrown down. Oh, all right. You hear that? The median referred to is, to is to be distinguished from the median by the Red Sea, which we first hear of as an existence in the time of Abraham. All right. So that's over there in the Gulf of California, all right? the true Red Sea. Most likely named after Midian, the son of Ketura. Midian, a, we understand it, was the land of the Midianite merchantmen who carried tin from Cornwall to Phoenicia and to other parts of the east. These Midianites in company with Ishmaelites, the Midianites in company with Ishmaelites are described in Genesis 37, 25 to 28 as coming from Gilead with their camels. I right, Gilead and Utah is that in Utah with their camels, all right? America, that's where camels originated in North America. Did you know that? We've proven that. Just Google it right now. And barren spicery and bomb and myrrh to Egypt. What Egypt? Mississippi, what you talking about? Little Egypt? Probably influenced to do so from the family relationship that existed between them. For the brothers of Cush were Mizraim, all right, Menis, or Menis, Mizraim, Menis, Foot, or Fat, and Canaan. Egypt was the land of Mizraim, and Foot and Canaan are considered to have been nearly intermediate places. The supposed Cushite remains at Kashel bear striking resemblance to some of the Ninevite sculptures, Nergal or Nimrod, the winged lion, exhibited in the British Museum, is a remarkable imitation of the winged lion of Kashel. All right, so that's these things are in museums, right? They're not in the actual place they supposedly found them, right? So how do we know where they really got them from? Because this one's in Britain. The purpose of our remarks upon the sons of Ham and their descendants in Western Europe is not to prove that the genesis of things was with them there more than the, with the sons of Japheth and to an extent the sons of Shem. In fact, all that we have advanced about them goes only so far as to show that they were in Europe and left their marks before, go, before going to the east. All right. So what he just said is, even though he just told you that a lot of these people might be 
descendants of Japheth and Ham is only doing that to show you that these people also were in Europe at some point before they had it, you know, because they were living under Japhet. He's the oldest before they, you know, went to their places or their lots or as he's saying, before they go into the East, taking with them the ideas that developed monuments akin to those of the land of the cradle of their race. All right, where's that coming from? Amaruka, the Egyptian, Indian, and Arab monuments have their Celtic art affinities. Just as the people of Egypt, India, and Arabia have Celtic relationship of speech, the principal characteristic of the ancient Irish style of architecture is observable in the architecture of these countries. Massive stones laid in irregular courses and doorways having sloping or inclining jams. All right, so uh, we continue in the book Ireland, or of the Chaldees, by Anna Wilkes, 1873. This is uh, chapter 9, and it says here, Cush and Nimrod. All right, Cush and Nimrod. Before we continue, I just want to remind you, again, they're just going over, you know, possible relations and descendants in Europe of these people. And again, Ham is the progenitor of Cush and Canaan. It says Kush Ethiopians, Canaan Egyptians, or Mizraim, just in both of them, right? And uh, you'll see Nimrod down here. Nimrod, right? Kush, Nimrod. All right, so we go back to the book again, chapter 9, Kush and Nimrod. It says the most influential and celebrated of the sons of Kush was Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, the beginning of whose kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne. We have reserved from the order of our remarks upon the three latter places reference to Babel until we treated of it in connection with Cush and Nimrod. Now remember that a lot of these places was actually built by um, Ashur, Ashur, the son of Shem, the Assyrians before Nimrod actually was uh, took over those places. There can be no doubt that to Semiramis was attributed a good deal of what was actually accomplished by Ninus. The testimony of Megasthenes as preserved by Abidinus of Tyre goes to show us that it was by Belus. Babylon was surrounded with a wall. Although some have represented that it was by Semiramis alone. This Belus may be distinguished from Bel, who began the city of the and tower of Babel. For the reason that we are told Bel had to leave both unfinished. If so, he could not have surrounded the city with a wall. We may suppose, though, that Ninus, as the son of Cush, inherited his father's title of Bel, or the confounder. The explanation, then, is that Ninus, or Nimrod, for he is called both names and differently, was the first to consolidate the Babylonian Empire, right? So he was one of the first to consolidate the empire. That's why he gets the credit as a progenitor of all the, you know, those cities. But again, remember, it was assured the Assyrians uh, there first and go out from in scripture and, um, and Nimrod eventually consolidated that whole place into the Babylonian Empire as we came to know it. And that he, like his father Cush, who must have left among the first Babylonians the impression of his greatness, was deified Bel, which word afterwards in most languages of Europe took the form of Belus. All right, that's they're talking about Nimrod. All right, according to Laird Re of Sibel, the tower crowned goddess and goddess of fortification was a Babylonian goddess and the counterpart of the deity presiding over bulwarks and fortresses. Consequently, she originated with the mystical Semiramis, supposed queen of Nimrod or Ninus. To us, it is almost unnecessary in the present confused state of the question to Semiramis being the wife of Ninus or Nimrod, and especially as we have only proposed to treat a certain parts of the subject in this work, to offer any contribution towards the solution of the difficulty. However, as far as we can judge, it is quite possible that Semiramis was the mother, not wife of Nimrod or Ninus, and therefore the wife of Bel or Cush, 
the first remains of this bell are to be found in the tradition druidic religion mythology stone monuments of europe Cronus or saturn was rhea's husband trace back to the original we find that Cronus was no other than the first king of babylon all right listen to this worshipped under the names of bell and Baal. in the genuine copies of eusebius there is no mention made of any belus actual king of assyria before ninus so according to that authority Cronus or saturn was not only cush bell or baal but ninus or nimrod all right listen under the name Cronus, nimrod is known as king of the cyclops who were his brethren and the inventors of tower building cyclopean what may be in the general way deduced from the foregoing is that with notwithstanding the different names under which Nimrod is represented, he inherited some of the nature and attributes of Bel or Cush, the con co confounder, which entitled him to be deified as his father was, and that he completed the tower and city of Babel, commenced by his father, who, if he conceived the building of this city and tower, may be fairly accredited with originating tower building, the invention of which is sometimes attributed to Nimrod. This may throw some light upon what are called the Cushite remains in Ireland, the round towers of that country. We continue in the book, Ireland, Ur of the Chaldees, by Anna Wilkes, 1873. This is chapter 10. And it says here, Cutites and Hyperboreans, Cutites. Colonies of Hyperboreans erroneously called Cutites reached as far as the Maotis at the north of the Euxine Sea and to the coast of the Adriatic. They extended their settlements to Asia and laid the foundation of the Ninevite and Babylonian monarchies. In prehistoric times, we have glimpses of them as having from the west of Europe gone northward over Scandinavia and Scythia and Europe, Russia. Many remaining in Umbria left their names afterwards remembered in association with the Mons Palatinos of Rome. They also went southward from the British islands or country of Britain as an integral portion at one time perhaps of the continent to Iberia, Spain, and Mauritania. All right, listen to this. Hence, it is easy to conceive how they may have progressed along the north coast of Africa, making settlements in conjunction with the sons of Mizraim, and extending their influence into Asia Minor, Southern Asia, and Hindustan, the while, of course, mixing and drawing closer the ties of consanguinity with the people of Put and Canaan and Seba and Havila and Sapta, Rama, and the other sons of Kush, of whom we know so little, but who must have in Egypt and in Hindustan with a certain Semitic admixture race, Semitic, created civilizations and empires. It may be as great as the Babylonian and Ninevite and coexistent with them. Brian says of the Hyperboreans, they were of the Titanic race and called Sindhi, a name, as I have shown, common among the Kutites. The Skindi are one family of those who live upon the Mauetis. Strabo speaks of them as called, among other names, Sauromatai. Those who live above the Exene or Easter and Adriatic were formerly called Hyperboreans and Sauromate and Arimaspians. These people were esteemed very sacred, and it is said that Apollo, when he was exiled from heaven and had his offspring slain, retired to their country. It seems he wept, and there was a tradition that every tear was amber. All right, and this is an example of what they're talking about and things uh, their so called sages wrote. It says here, Apollo and Argonaut. It says they are sometimes represented as Arima Spians, and their chief priestesses were named Oespis Loksho and Hekarji, by whom the Hyperborean rites are said to have been brought to Delos. They never returned, but they took up their residence and officiated in the island, Delos. People from the same quarter are said to have come to Delphi in Phocis and to have found out that the oracular seat of Apollo, 
Pausanias produces from this the evidence of the ancient Christus Baal. He makes mention of Olin the Hyperborean as the first prophet of Delphi, and further says that the first temple of the deity was founded by him in conjunction with Pegasus and Agius, the Mons Palatinus at Rome was supposed to have been occupied by Hyperboreans. There was also in Hyperborean a great fame called Abaris, who is mentioned by Herodotus. He was the son of Zeus, styled Sutis or Suits, and is represented as very known in the art of divination and gifted with supernatural powers. He also gives what Brian quotes from Ferenicus, Scolia, and Pliny Olympius. He sang also of the Hyperboreans who live in the extremities of the world under the temple of Apollo, far removed from the den of war. They are celebrated as being of the ancient blood of Titans and were a colony placed in this wintry climate by the Arimaspian monarch, the son of Boreas. All right. Another one says here, the two most distant colonies of this family westward were upon the Atlantic Ocean. The one in Europe to the north, the other opposite of the of the extreme part of Africa. The country of the latter was Mauritania, whose inhabitants were at the Atlantic Ethiopians. They looked upon themselves as of the same family as the gods, and they were certainly descended from some of the first deified mortals. All right, you hear that? Those who occupied the province of Iberia, Spain, and Baetica on the other side went under the same titles and preserved the same histories as those who have been mentioned before. And he further remarks, although Ireland seems never to have entered Brian's mind as connected with Cuttite history, every sentence in these quotations respecting the Hyperboreans when taken in connection with Irish records seems to point to Ireland as the home of that people to whom ancient Greek authors refer as the Hyperboreans. Page 235. For additional information on same subject, he refers to O'Brien's Round Towers, who quotes through Brian from Mr. Booth's translation of the notice respecting the Insula Hyperborea by Diodorus Siculus, page 396 and 397, O'Brien. And while we agree with Mr. Keane that Ireland never entered Mr. Brian's mind in connection with Cuttite history, still we cannot but find fault with the former attributing everything archaic, everything with Ninevite, Babylonian, and Egyptian resemblances in Ireland to the descendants of Cush. If we take the word Hyperborean as generally understood, it offers contradiction to this hyper, beyond, Boreas, north, beyond Boreas, or the north, example, an inhabitant of the north, or the district over which the descendants of Japhet are supposed to have gone. Therefore, a people not Hamitic as those of Cush undoubtedly were. But instead of Hyperborean, we read Heberborean, or, oh, he's saying instead of hyper is Heber, Eber, Borean, we are then led to the consideration that of all names of countries, not one reminds us so much of Eber, Heber, and the Hebrew as Iberia, Iberia, or as it was sometimes spelled, Hiberia. The name Heber must have been familiar to the Phoenicians who traded with Tarshish, the country of Heber, who gave his name to Hibernia. I remember Phoenicians and what we were reading earlier, Phoenician origin of the Britons, Scots, and Anglo-Saxons, all right? We're not going to generalize, but hey, it was making a connection here, right? The Phoenicians must have been familiar with Heber, who gave his name to Hibernia. The Greeks must have adopted the word from the Phoenicians and of as the country or countries of Heber was to be the earlier indeed to the latter Greeks, quite undefined beyond their knowledge. So it is possible, indeed likely, that the word hyper, beyond, had undergone a change with the Greeks even before the advent of Cecrops or Cadmus, all right? They changed it up, the Greeks. The latter did not bring the language of the people of the first states of Greece out of Phoenicia. It was to a great extent already being spoken there. He only brought them their alphabet. It may be necessary to offer a conjecture as to how Boreas became affixed to the word in question, the north of Europe, to the Greeks and Romans, as we hinted before, was as mysterious as the people who wandered there, 
so mysterious indeed that a race of in residing in Western Europe were called the Hyperbody by them. Boreas is generally explained the northern wind or bellowing wind. Hyperborea was unquestionably the land of the Druid and Bard. All right, the land of the Druid, Heber, Borea, Heber, whose religions was identical with that of the latter Hebrew, very identical to that of the Hebrew. Now, if we understand that in the Welsh language, P, B, and T are commutable letters, and in Irish, besides others, B and D, both tongues in this respect simply exemplifying the universal affection of sounds, we have some light thrown upon Bard, Druid, and Bruidy Irish, as having been the same in meaning. There is very little, if any, distinction between the original Bard or Druid. Derwid, Ja, Bard, Wirt, Bald. Okay, I ain't gonna, you know, read that, read that, but, you know, the Druid is a Bard, according to the reason, nature, and necessity of things, and his office is to instruct Bardubs and Poo. If in the Irish and Welsh the term Bard was equivalent to Druid, the Greeks were not astray in rendering Druid a Bard. And if they interpret Bruid by Boreas, all right, Bard is a Druid, right? So Bruidi by Boreas, from the word to their mind, signifying as well as the northern or Belwin wind, the particular locality whence it came to them, they only used a very natural idiom, one that originated perhaps from Bar in Celtic, which supplied the first idiom of the Greek, the top because of the north or the region of Boreas, to them would appear away from above in the top as it were or north of their country. This view is strengthened by the fact that the Hyperboreans always sent their offerings southward. So as we have before noticed, their priestesses are said to have brought the Hyperborean rites to Delos, and people from their country to have gone to Delphi and Phocis and discovered the oracular seat of Apollo. If this be admitted, the country of the Hyperborean might equal reason have been called the country of the Heber Druids, the Heber Druids or the Heber Bards, the Heber Bards, Hyperborean Heber Bards, Heber Bards, the priest poets, the not priest kings, but priest poets, the Eber Bards, who according to Pausanias and others came into Greece and originated sacrifice and the mysteries of their faith there. The more the question of the distribution of the first races of mankind is studied, the more we are brought to the belief of the impossibility of arriving at anything certain as to where the sons of Noah remained longest in Europe. Yet no one who has looked for particulars and thought about the dispersion of Noah's family, but must be struck with evidences of their having been in Europe together. But judged by language and mythology, physical and ph psychological characteristics by monumental stones or fossil remains and separated from the necessity of prejudgment, we must be convinced by the overwhelming testimony in favor of the sons of Noah and their families having both settled and sojourned in Europe. All right, listen. Look north, south, east, and west from the pole to the pole over Europe, Asia, America, and again, Europe, speech, faith, hope, superstition, joy, and fear, inscribed stone and labored ornament, city, empire, prosperity, decline, and each emphatically proves the universal affinity of nations and of people and their handiworks. Shem, all right, now we're about to get into sign. Shem was the father of all the sons of Heber. And we cannot possibly perceive how Iberia could have taken its name unless it was from Heber, Eber, Iberia, Eber, 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 Iberia, Iberia, or some one of his sons of the same name. The old Iberians were undoubtedly of the same race as the Hebrew and whether they be called Celtic in common with those of the British islands and Gaul or not, it make little matter for the old Chaldean institutions, ceremonies were druidical. Chaldean were druids. Chaldean institutions were druidical. Or conversely, if it be preferred, 
the old druidical institutions ceremonies were Chaldean, if you like it like that better. All right, so we continue in the book Ireland, Ur of the Chaldees by Anna Wilkes, 1873. And we're in chapter 11 now. And now we talk about the sons of Shem. All right, I know we mentioned uh, the prosperity of uh, Japheth and Ham and where their descendants might have been and what influence they would have had in Europe. But now we're going to talk about the sons of Shem and their influence in Europe. We already got, you know, the drop on Elam, Ashur, Afrashad, Lud, and Aram, right? We're going to get it again. Again, this is chapter 11, the sons of Shem. It says here, the sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arfarshad, Lud, and Aram. The traces of them are numerous in Western Europe. Like the Kutite and Japhetian, these are to be found in the comparison of their language, names of people and places, monumental art remains. The names of people are perhaps as good evidence. If we accept the names of places, which endure longest uncorrupted, as can be produced and prove of Semitic occupancy of Europe. The chief consideration then is to show how these remains are discoverable in the quarter indicated in a proportion that sets down as trifling what has been referred to in favor of Shem and his children distributing themselves over Southern Asia prior to the settlement of Europe. There are fewer traces of the Elamites and the people of Ashur to be found in Europe, although they must have proceeded in their easterly course through it. It is not a little interesting to contemplate the pastoral staff or crook which is yet to be seen on their monuments, and the winged bull or Ashur, the traveler, suggested as some believe by the wings of the bull, just as the winged lion already referred to symbolized the mighty hunter. And Think of thousands of years that have gone over the efforts of man, leaving almost untoothed links that prove the present, but the sequence of his most remote existence. The people of Elam and Ashur took with them the, resembra the remembrance of the deluge, which they have so well assisted in sending down to posterity in writing. The Ashur Bani Pal, so frequently represented in the stone remains of Asia, means literally an Irish Ashur of the white pal or mantle, identifying him with the white robe priest or druids. Arfreshad, if Noah was represented under the form of a fish, Arfreshad was in Chaldea under that of a serpent. All right, Arfreshad's people, they were the serpent. The serpent was an emblem of wisdom and as such appropriately symbolic of the founder of the great Chaldean nation. In Celtic mythology, Arfishad says of himself, I am a druid, I am an architect, I am a prophet, I am a serpent. All right? And this is in Celtic mythology. Did you know there was an Arfishad in Celtic mythology? Arfishad is understood by the Welsh as Aed, Mard, father of Pridian, supposed by some instead Brute, to have been the origin of the name Britan, all right? It is not usual to hear very learned people refer to the serpent as a Chaldean sign and then dismiss the idea of it from their minds, little thinking how deeply interesting the investigation of the Chaldean sign would prove if they sought to view it by the light of Bardic tradition and the researches of recent archaeologists. The serpent was not only a Chaldean, but an Israelitish sign, all right? The serpent is also an Israelitish sign, Chaldean and Israelite sign, the serpent, all right? We're not talking about demon or worshiping snakes here, right? You better read your scripture. Moses and the brass serpent, right? Drakons, what is a fiery serpent, Seraphim, all right? Preserved by them even down to the time of Hezekiah. The old form of the word Europe, Aur Ab, signifies a serpent, all right? Europe, Aur Ab, signifies a serpent. If, as it is generally admitted, this was a Chaldean emblem, who was it emblematic of but Arfashad, the eldest son of Shem? 
the light and leader of the Chaldeans, all right, Arfishad was worshipped as a god under the form of a serpent, and everywhere throughout Europe and into Asia and Egypt, the serpent is to be found cut upon stone and the principal feature in varieties of ornamental forms. Ireland, above other places in the world, is distinguished by the remains of the serpent in ornamental forms, conspicuous on gold and silver vessels, war instruments on manuscripts, and in stone. In Scotland, also, this serpent form is found upon her stones, bronze armlets, proving how general and at the same time mysterious must have been the serpent among the aboriginal inhabitants of Hibernia and Albion, among the Scytho Europeans, the Scandinavians, the Greeks, whose red dragon, dragon of the Greeks, according to Pausanias, was only a large snake, the people that formed the Roman states, indeed, it may be said among all people, the serpent was a mysterious sign. And so its worship was the first form of idolatry in Europe after Arfashad. The pastoral staff or crook, as distinguished from the crozier, which is more correctly in the form of a cross, perhaps owes its origin to the serpent. All right, just like the Maya holding their staff and it's a snake in the, in the top part, the snake's head. All right, just like Moses grabbing that tail of a snake and it becomes a staff, that's scripture. There was in Dr. Petrie's collection a pastoral staff found in the last century at Cashel. Its handle form is that of a scaled serpent turning round like a volute with figures introduced in the center and on the top part of the staff handle the figure of a fish. The pastoral staff used by the bishops of some Christian churches is to be traced to the Roman Augur then to the Etrurians, then to the Babylonians, who had it from Ashur, the son of Shem, all right, who with Nimrod and Elam went from Shinar to build Nineveh, all right, all three of them went and built Nineveh and its cities, it wasn't just Nimrod, remember, their distinguished descendants of Shem are represented with this crook, as may be seen by any visitor to the Egyptian and Assyrian courts of the British Museum. Again, these ancient relics and artifacts are in Britain. They're not even in, how do you know where they really came from? Notices of the serpent or adder are to be found throughout Celtic mythology. The legends of Cumberland refer to the great worm. No doubt the serpent is meant. But we must not forget to notice here what is probably the greatest of all relics of serpent symbolism we allude to the serpentine disposition of the 4,000 stones of Karnak in Brittany. Karnak is supposed to mean the Karn or grave of Ak, sometimes used for the word serpent, or may mean from the quantity of huge stones resembling a town, the town or city of Ak, or the serpent from Katar, pronounced Kar, a town or city. Karnak is the most remarkable place in Armorica, Armorica. Another name for Brittany, all right? Another name for what? For Brittany is what? Armorica, Armorica, Armerica, Armorica. And has perhaps more extensive juridical remains than are to be found in any one place. Brittany is a land of Prydian, or Britain, as the word is given in English out of the Welsh. Prydian was known to the Welsh as the son of Aed, Mawar. The Irish is Armor. All right, from whom Armorica took its name. This patriarchal personage is known also to the Scotch, Irish, and Welsh as Arthur. Arthur Armorica, King Press. We're talking about what we're talking about. Who is Presser John? But he seems to have been better known as the Great R or Armor. The word Mar in Welsh seems to have been substituted for Par Parshetic, literally Arfashat. The Arfishad in the same Celtic dialect means the honorable or great. In the Gaelic expresses supreme power. All right, that's what it means. Josephus says, Arfishad named the Arfishadites, who are now called the Chaldeans. All right, quoting Josephus, we got that in the last video, right? We went right to the book, his original book, Josephus' writings, where he named the Chaldeans 
basically the descendants of Arfishad or Arfishadites, he called them, who are now called Chaldeans, the Kuldis. Remember who are the Kuldis? The Kuldis we read earlier, right? That's what they were calling themselves, the Picts. The Picts, right? In that other book, the Picts and the Kuldis are the ancient Chaldeans of Mesopotamia. Remember, so-called Mesopotamia. The Kuldis, as we will show, were descended from them. The Ad of the Quran, who is associated with the people of Noah, and of the Tamud, of Tamud, and of Abraham, and of the inhabitants of Madian. One of the cities which were overthrown was evidently Arfishad. All right, Arfishad. All these people are from Arfishad. Arfishad. That's where Moses went. Continue says, Pait or Picti. Picked are derived from Fashad. Fashad. Picked. Fashad or are other forms of the word. You see this? The pigs are descendants of Fashad or Afashad. Fashad. Picti. Pait. Picked are derived from Fashad or are other forms of the word. The prefix supplied, and we have the Arfashad of Genesis and Josephus. There are for the Picti. Apart from the old notion of the painted people of the early history of Scotland, means a people of power, honor, and greatness. All right, that's what Picti means. The people from Fashad, the people from Arfashad. This is deep because in the other book we read earlier, this is really deep. How you guys remember? It was telling you that they were different people. These pigs, who they eventually started naming Celts, right? Celts or Celts. They weren't the same as the the Gaulish people or the Gomara people from Gomer or the Simri or even the Iberians that were coming up as Celts. All right, they were different people. Now we see. Now we see who they were. They were coming from Shem or Arfashad. The pigs, all right? They were coming from Shem. These great people, all right? Meaning great people, honor and greatness. The painted people, the ones with the tattoos, the painted people the er of early history of Scotland, all right? All right, the original indigenous people, they came from Arfishad. Arfishad then was the first Druid, architect, prophet, and serpent of tradition and history. That's a big one right there. Now, I'm going to show you something, guys. I'm going to show you something. And this is from so-called uh, the fictional world of King Arthur, right? But now we know what King Arthur means, right? Now we know what King Arthur means. So check this out. All right. So I don't remember what I was searching for in Google that I came across this, but this was under one of King Arthur's uh, myths of the round table. Um, the families, one of the families of persons or knights was Arfishad Le Gros, and this is the one, uh, this is his symbol. As you know, this symbol has been on many family crests in Europe. Uh, we know this goes back to a very ancient symbol. What is the emblem <laughs> of the Garden of Eden, the Tav, or the Hebrew Tav, as they call the cross, you know? Was it doing under Arfishad, right? Well, he is the son of Shem, right? It makes sense. People from coming from the Garden of Eden, right? Noah, one of his uh, grandfathers, right? His actual grandfather, Noah, coming from the actual Garden of Eden or the place where they were the Antediluvians, right? X marks the spot, right? So I thought this was very interesting to see. So if you see the symbol again, it's, this could be way more than myth as they want to put everything in, in these stories, right? So they make these things into myths. So as you can see in the story of King Arthur, you have Arfishad too, as one of the families or founders represented in the round table. And this is his symbol. So you can Google this, Arfishad Le Gros, as you can see for yourself. I'm gonna go back to the book. So again, Arfishad was then the first Druid or architect, prophet and serpent of tradition and history. He's of the Picti people. Picked pigs, the pigs are from Fashad, all right? Now you know who the ancient pigs are of people of Shem. There could be nothing more suggestive of the countries of the South, especially Ireland, than these attributes of Arfashad. The mind dwells upon the Druid and his mysterious but grand worship. It turns to the knowledge of the Celtic architectural wonders distributed over Ireland, Scotland, England, Wales, and France 
conceives that the main business of the Druid was to augur prophecy and interpret omens and to preserve, as was the case, more especially in Ireland, veneration of the serpent. When St. Patrick is said to have banished the snakes out of Ireland, I remember, and I know a lot of you associated that to your people being thrown out of Ireland. Well, now you understand on a deeper level, talking about the descendants of Arfishad or Shem. When St. Patrick is said to have banished the snakes out of Ireland, it may be understood as a figurative way of expressing that he abolished serpent worship. Not just serpent worship, but he got rid of the people, right? Yet it is curious to observe how the remains of the serpent form lingered in the minds of the cloistered monks who have given us such unparalleled specimens of, of ornamental initial letters as are preserved in the books of Kells and Bellymode, etc. Lude, Arfishad, and Aram would seem to have been neighbors as well as brothers, as appears from the altars of Lude. Lude was nearly the old name of Normandy, adjacent to Armorica, all right? The Normans are from Lude, Armorica. The names derived from Lude are principally found in Scotland and Wales. Although others are to be found throughout Europe, such as the Luc Dunum, the ancient Batavorum, and now called Leiden, the Trojani Ludi, games celebrated in the Roman circus and said to have been instituted by Aeneas, are, it is remarkable, remembered in Wales at the present day. All right. The children there play at the game of Troy, and it is the opinion of many lettered Welshmen that the site of the siege of Troy is to be found in Britain. Anim Dro of the race of Predain is identified by them as Aenus. Aenis. There are perhaps more wonderful things in connection with the story of Troy to be found in Welsh tradition than can be summoned out of the Greek and Roman classics, all right? They're letting you know here some drop. The name Aram, the last son of Shem, is apparently prefixed to the word Arimaspian, another title of the Hyperborean, as already noticed. All right, so you see these Hyper or Heber, these are just all sons of Shem. All right, Heber is the son of Shem, descendant of Shem, Aram and the Aramites. All right, descendants of Shem, the Arimaspians, known to Pliny, people dwelling near rivers of the tribe of Aram, mixed with those called. Hyperboreans, descendants of Arfashad. They were also dwellers in Padan Aram, sometimes understood as part of Aram Naharam, and at other times as the entire of it, or Chaldea. All right? We're talking about the same people and nations. Josephus says, Uz, one of the sons of Aram, all right? Uz or Oz, right? Uz or Oz, one of the sons of Aram, Oz, Uz, founded. Trashonites and Damascus, all right? These are all descendants of Shem. Who, who founded Damascus? A descendant of Shem, Uz or Oz. He spells Hul, Ul. This person, he tells us, founded Armenia. The name is preserved in the word Ulster, Ulswater, and Hul, all right? That's the same person, Uz or Oz or Oz. A descendant of Aram, a descendant of Shem, all right? Of the third son of Aram, Gether, we know little beyond what Josephus informs. He founded the Bactrians. If so, their country lays claim to as ancient a prosperity as any probably in Asia. Bactria was the first entrepot of trade that we hear of there and is distinguished for having been the seat of the religion of Sorester, magic, astrology, and fire worship so characteristic of the Chaldeans and the original Irish. The Jewish historian further makes us aware that Mash, the next son of Aram, was Mesa. All right, Mash or Mesa, and says he founded the Messinians, now called Charax Spasini. We next turn more particularly to the sons of Arfashad, having devoted considerable space to his brothers and their children all right so we're going to a descendant of arfisha which is the next chapter which is salah all right so again just again we're in the 
1611 King James uh, Bible where they have this uh, genealogical chart of the nations. Pretty good chart. Even tells you where you can find it in the Bible and so, some of them. So again, sons of Shem, we have Ashur, the progenitor of Assyrians, Elam of the Persians, right? Arfashat of Salah, we're about to read. Lud, remember Lud, the Lydians, Lud, and also London, the the uh, the founder of London, Lud, Lud, Aram, and the Aramites, and we just saw uh, other descendants of Aram. So again, I think we have uh, one more chapter left in us today, and we're still in the book Ireland, or of the Chaldees by Anna Wilkes from 1873, and we're all the way in chapter 12. And again, Salah, remember Salah, again, a descendant Salah of Arfashad, who is a son of Shem, right? And Salah is actually the dad or father of Eber, of the Hebrews, Eber, Eber, Eber. All right, let's go. It says Salah, Salah, Shalah, or Saleh. Different spellings of the name according to respectively Luke 3, 35, Genesis 11 12 chronicles 118 and the quran chapter 7 page 124 etc as the son of arfishat salah has left considerable marks of his existence in europe one of the oldest druidical seats in britain is car saluk saluk now called salisbury 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 retaining the name of salah in both these forms the latter form of the word is almost preserved as applied to the crags near Arthur's seat, Edinburgh, Salisbury, Crags. The record of Bancors, Bancors, or places of meeting for the white robed singers or priests, as preserved in the Welsh, point to Salisbury as one of the most important of the Druidical circles. The next most remarkable circle is Car Ivrock, Hebrock. Eboricum, the old name of York, the city of Heber, as it was now known from, no doubt, a Heber descendant of Salah. All right. Again, Eboricum. All right. And somebody put on me to the drop, you know, Boricua. And when I and I when I read that Eboricum in the last video, I also thought the same thing. That sounds like Boricua. Eboricum. Eboricua. <laughs> The old name of York, the city of Heber, Hebrog, Eber, as it was known from, no doubt a Heber descendant of Salah. It is rather a remarkable fact that almost always are built on the sites of the old cars or sars or seats of the Druids, the cathedrals of modern times, such as Salisbury, York, Canterbury, Winchester, Gloucester, Carlisle, Manchester, Worcester, Chester, Warwick, Lincoln, Chichester. And many others, all right? So it is very interesting that these places where we know were known Druid seats actually happen to be where all these cathedrals are today, right? Remember, this is from an ancient world. They're just recycling these buildings, all right? We know that. It says the seats of three arch Druids were, as before, referred to Lud or London. Remember Lud, Son of Shem, Evrock or York, and Carleon and Mammothshire. One of the descendants of Heber was Levi. Levi or Lewis is a Celtic word. Jacob names one of his sons Levi. This word Levi or Lewis is in Gaelic Leub. All right. So very interesting. Where did Jacob get the inspiration to name one of his sons Levi? Huh? Or Lewis is in Gaelic Leub. Leub or Lud. Right? From his descendant uncle right it's semitic meaning is generally understood to be re reader or priest right the name is more frequently known as lewis and is in use among the freemasons of the present day their order having preserved much of the arfishadite teaching all right freemasons preserve what the arfishadite teachings the eldest son of a mason is called a lewis all right deep let's drop right here Deep drop. Many families in Europe bear names distinctively pointing to a Levite origin, such as Lewis, Lewis, Levi, Le Levison, etc., and are more especially peculiar to England. The island of Lewis in the Hebrides, Luz and Sussex, Lewisham, 
near London are places that prove in their names their celto Hiberian origin. The name Looped Bat Gaelic points to Levites of the Mosaic Dispensation, reminding us of the architects who firstborn sons were dedicated to the service of the temple. The early holy circle of men of the Ekdrash of Druids or the unhewn stone altars were singers or men of the chorus or choirs singers reciters and readers or readers the word levite expresses this the custom of consecrating the firstborn son of each family of the chaldeans to god was preserved by the jews and can be traced to have originated with the early druids the great priesthood of arfershot and the early teachings of this body consisted of the right keeping of the records of the chaldean rule the uninitiated can perceive alone from the outward forms of symbols of freemasonry that there is much in it that originated with the chaldean mysteries and teachings of the druids the three rays of light symbolizing the name of the most high god formed us and the circle the ark the temple of the sun the moon and the stars the signs of the zodiac reference to the mariners of the ark and their first grand master who was followed by sons of may templars knights of saint john or Anis, and the grand cross refer directly to the religion of noah all right you hear this oanus john saint john awayness saint john Preston john what we going on the grand cross talking about templars who's the original templars grand masters what's going on here <laughs> directly to the religion of noah and his sons the mason of today is instructed in the forms and rites and mysteries of the diviners and druids all right deep the diviners and druids of the past have bequeathed to the present much that is to be learned by the educated. Eboricum, 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 <laughs> one of the grand seats of the Chaldean faith, and then chief city of Britain, was the center of Chaldean power. Listen, because we already got this. This is this was happening there in England. Chaldean power, right? Eboricum. And Hebrews have held possessions there from the most ancient times, as is well known that the Chaldean Hebrews were joined by numbers of the children of Israel, and the identity of the old house was lost in that way. There is no doubt, neither should we have any hesitation in saying that the Chaldee or Kuldi, Chaldee or the Kuldi, remember the pigs, held the faith of the Hebrew pure for many ages before and until sometime after the establishment of Christianity. Those who held the old faith of the Essenians accepted Jesus of Nazareth as a prophet and mediator and did so still holding the Hebrew observances of times, Sabbaths, and ancient seasons, which are proven by the calendars of the feast, feast and fast. The ancient Jewish customs as known to us corroborate what is asserted that the old Celts were no other than Chaldean all right the Jewish customs prove this he's letting you know this is a major drop you know we're learning we're reading we're trying to put all this together shout out again to big Judah <laughs> it's all connected we're all connecting the dots right the ancient Jewish customs as known to us corroborate what is asserted that the old Celts the old cells we're not talking about those new Simri cells the Gaelish the, the Japhets and the Hamites that were eventually also bunched under and grouped under Celts. We're talking about the old Celts were no other than Chaldean and consequently the fathers of Israel. The old Cornish con contains as much or more Hebrew than the Welsh. All right. The old Cornish again contains as much or more Hebrew than the Welsh. All right. As much Hebrew. When they're saying right here, Chaldean are the fathers of Israel and people get feel a certain way remember where abraham was born and where his parents were remember chaldea right he came out of chaldea that's what they're talking about isn't he the father of all of his of, of the hebrews right same thing and now again major drop cornish language contains so much or more hebrew than the welsh the wording 
of a release given in the time of one of the Henrys and which is signed by Joachai or Kent or and Jorin, his brother Jew or Jork says, we, the undersigned, declare that the prior and the convent of Durnham are released from us and from our heirs and from all Jews after us from the creation of the world to the face of the peers and Paul. The tenure of these men of York in their own eyes must have been a most ancient one. The above is taken from a stara or Jewish covenant of Durham, which was noticed in the Jewish Chronicle sometime about July of last year. It is only one of many such like deeds that go to prove the ancient people of God to have been long holders of property in England. All right, they were they've been there, the people of God, right? The ancient people of God of Hawa. They had land where in England, the persecution and shameful manner of defrauding, banishing, and preventing them from retaining their ancient land holdings are matters that disgrace many pages of English history. That's major draw right here. You hear that? That's major draw. What's going on? Continuing says the deathbed of William the Conqueror was not the only one haunted by remembrances of cruelty and injustice done to the house of Israel. Listen, this is major drop here. He only followed the steps of the Romans who had for centuries stri striving to extirpate the Druids and priests and Levites who crowded the bankers and filled the cities of the harpers of the Hyperboreans. It was one thing to change the names of the places and try to Latinize and alter everything, but the hearts of the Celtic people could not be changed. The bards, coarbs, and druids kept their faith and handed it down to their children in verses that have gone up to the Most High ever since Shinar was first peopled. The Psalter of old Sarum, Salisbury is no new song, and Asaph and Daniel and David were names known long before the time of Psalms were, were collected by the son of Jesse. The laws of Dwinwal Moel Mood are the laws of Daniel, who lived long anterior to the Chaldean prophet, who was delivered from the lion's den. Daniel of Bangor was founder of a choir of Levites before this Chaldean prophet was born. Sons of the Daniel first mentioned are the Mac Daniels. All right, listen, this is deep. This is deep right here. This is a lot of good drop right here. You know, I'm reading and learning with you guys. I've never read this before. This is deep. So I'm also trying to analyze what I'm reading. Hope you guys are doing the same. It says here, the sons of Daniel first mentioned are the Mac Daniels, the Daniels, the McDonald's, the Dinevals, etc. The wars of the McDonald's and McLoyds of the Isles, as referred to elsewhere in this work, were of particular significance, far beyond what is generally understood of them by the student of Earth's history. The ancient people referred to by the Venerable Betty as Kuldis were composed of many of the above families. This description identifies them with the Essenians and Therapeutes. A few more words about Salah, the recurrence of the name so frequently in the Psalms and the singularity of its position throughout has puzzled many. It stands separate in the Psalms. All right, remember that word is like a break in between the Psalms. So, for example, the earth and all its inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Salah. And then it just continues like all of a sudden, but it doesn't explain why Salah is there. So that's what they're talking about, all right? The arrows of Joktan took with them numerous legends of Salah to their country, as we know it in the present day, Arabia, and to Europe again with Mahomet. To the Mahomet in the story of Salah is quite familiar. He is represented by them to be of the land of the ancient Arab, all right? So again, where is Salah from? Well, the land of the ancient Arab. Who's the ancient Arabs, right? Ishmael, right? Ishmael is the son of Abraham, right? Right? Chaldea. Where was there Abraham from? Chaldea, Ireland. Ireland of the Chaldees. Ireland or of the Chaldees. Again, to the Mahimatan. The Mahimatan. The story of Salah is quite familiar. He is represented by them to be the 
land of the ancient Arab. This must not be understood as the dwelling place, but the land from which they first migrated. Where is Ishmael's dad from again? Abraham from Shinar or Chaldea, right? The part of Shinar called Irem. Irem, remember, we read this in the last video that even in Arab history, they're literally saying Ireland, they're calling it Aram, where they came from, right? The Ishmaelites, Irem, Irem, right? Or Abraham, Irem, Irem, Ireland, near or in which was Al Ras, Madian, in fact, the land of Ad and Tamud, which means of Arfarshad, Ayat Mar. Remember, look at all the correlations. And of Terah, the father of Abraham. All right, Arfishad, the land of Arfishad and of Terah and Abraham. That was in Irem, Ireland. That was in Irem, Ireland. All right, some places of consequence in Europe yet retain the name of Salah. Salah, a town of Trace near the mouth of the Hebrews, Salamis or Salamina, a town of the east of Cyprus, Salapia, a town of Apulia, to which Hannibal retired after the Battle of Cannae, Salara, a town of Africa, Propia, taken by Scipio, and Salamanca in Spain, the Salasi, a people of Sipalsa and Gaul, were descended of Salah, Salasi, Salah. There are some names of people corresponding to Salah, Salah, Salaman, and perhaps Solomon, and Saleh. All right. So, Salah, Salazar, huh? Salah. All right. So, we're going to end it here for today. And, you know, that was a great draw. We're going to get into chapter 13 on the next video and possibly some more other books. Remember, we read this book. We're going to get into more of this book and other videos. This one in ancient Britons. We're going to break down all these people that were in this part of the world as well. And how they were connected to the ancient promised land, the true old world, Amaruka. The sons of Shem, right? The sons of Shem. <laughs>